Welcome to Kitchen More. In this video, we will discuss about the classroom observation tool for teachers 1 to 3 for the school year 2023 to 2024. The basis for the content of this video is stipulated in the DepEd Memorandum No. 8 series of 2023, which is also known as Multi-Year Guidelines on the Results-Based Performance Management System, Philippine Professional Standards for Teachers. We also made use of the PPSD resource package for important insights that we can share here for further understanding of each indicators in the COT RPMS for teachers 1 to 3. Here I will discuss the 9 indicators of the Classroom Observation Tool or COT for teachers 1 to 3 for school year 2023 to 2024. This is from DepEd Memorandum No. 8 series of 2023. As presented here, we have here the arrangement of the classroom observable indicators for the school year 2023 to 2024. We are now in year 2, and there are 9 indicators that we need to cover for the whole school year, of which 6 will be covered every quarter. As you can see in the presentation, the first and third quarters cover only objectives 1 to 6, while the second and third quarters cover objectives 1 to 3 and 7 to 9. As we go on with the discussion, rest assured that I will provide examples that will help and guide you in the preparation of your classroom observation and to help you get the highest possible score of 7. So, stay tuned! The first classroom observable indicator of the COT RPMS for teachers 1 to 3 is applied knowledge of content within and across curriculum teaching areas. In this indicator, we will tackle the three key concepts that we need to understand in order to apply them effectively in the preparation of our lesson. In this indicator, we teachers are expected to apply accurate, in-depth, and a broad knowledge of content and pedagogy that will help create a conducive learning environment that enables an in-depth and sophisticated understanding of the teaching and learning process to meet individual or group learning needs within and across curriculum teaching areas. Let's delve deeper into the three key concepts of Indicator 1, namely knowledge of content and pedagogy within the curriculum teaching area and across curriculum teaching area. The first one is knowledge of content and pedagogy. It is the integration of expertise and teaching skills for a particular area, the appropriateness of the pedagogy to the teaching area. So this means that we are combining what we know as a teacher and how well we can teach in a specific subject area and making sure that the way we teach matches the needs of the subject area. For example, in teaching subject verb agreement to my English class, I need to be an expert in the rules of forming correct and meaningful sentences and to make it effective, I need to use appropriate teaching methods like incorporating real-life examples and interactive activities which are perfectly suited to teaching grammar. This method helps me make my English subject engaging and practical for my students, helping them improve their writing and communication skills. So, it's all about combining what we know with how we teach in a way that makes sense for the specific subject that we are teaching. The next one is within curriculum teaching area. It is the inclusion of appropriately chosen intradisciplinary topics and enabling learning competencies within the curriculum guide of a specific learning or subject area and grade level. By the way, what is intradisciplinary topic? Intradisciplinary topics refer to topics that are within a specific subject area and are interconnected. These topics are chosen to enable students to develop a deep understanding of the subject matter by integrating the knowledge and skills within one subject area. So, if your subject is mathematics, then you integrate a previous lesson in mathematics like the one that they had in the previous grade level. That is already an example. Then we have another example in English 9. My topic is using conditionals in expressing arguments. I can integrate an interdisciplinary topic on the verb tenses which was their previous topic in grade 7. 
In this way, they can make a connection between what they have learned previously and what they are studying at the present. The last key concept for Indicator 1 is a cross-curriculum teaching area. Making meaningful connections and including appropriate interdisciplinary topics and learning competencies cited in the curriculum guide. Here comes what we call an interdisciplinary topic. What is it? An interdisciplinary topic is like combining elements from multiple disciplines. Simply put, it is the integration of elements of other subjects with the learning area that we are teaching. It means that we link different subjects or topics to make learning more relevant and in order for the learners to achieve the specific skills and knowledge they are expected to acquire. For example, if your subject is mathematics, you can integrate geography in which the learners will analyze climate data and its effects on regions. If you are teaching English, for example, and your topic is writing essays, then you can integrate science by letting your learners read scientific articles and write essays to communicate their understanding of complex scientific concepts. In my English class, particularly in grade 9, I commonly integrate music to it. For example, in my topic on conditional sentences, I make use of the songs that contain conditional sentences in it. When I did it to my class, the learners were very excited and well engaged and they wanted more. So in this way, I was able to integrate music to English subject, plus I made the teaching learning process more engaging. These are just a few of the many examples of interdisciplinary topics that we can link together to help our learners gain a meaningful experience during the teaching learning process. Just always remember that our integration must be in-depth, meaning the way we link other topics from other subjects should be done meaningfully so students will fully understand how they connect and how one subject helps them understand the other. Now let's proceed to Indicator 2. Indicator 2. Use the range of teaching strategies that enhance learner achievement in literacy and numeracy skills. Let's tackle the key concepts here. There are two key concepts that we need to consider in this indicator. These are literacy and numeracy skills. Literacy skills refer to the skills needed for reading and writing. This may include awareness of sounds of language, awareness of print, and the relationship between letters and sounds. Other skills such as creating knowledge through writing as well as developing media and technology are part of literacy skills. Simply put, literacy refers to the ability to read, write, and understand written and spoken language. Then we have numeracy skills. Numeracy skills refer to the skills which consist of comprehending and applying fundamental arithmetic operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Numeracy skills may also include the ability to reason with mathematical concepts like interpreting data, charts, and diagrams, process information, solve problems, and make decisions based on logic. In simple terms, numeracy skills refer to the ability of an individual to use and comprehend mathematical concepts and operations. Now, how do we enhance the learner's achievement of the literacy and numeracy skills? Let's take this example. Teacher Jen teaches a class of grade 10 students. In one of her English lessons, she introduces a practical activity related to grocery shopping. She asks her students to create a shopping list for a family meal. Each student has to plan a meal, list the ingredients required, and estimate the total cost of purchasing those items from a grocery store. She then instructs her students to research and write short descriptions of each ingredient on their shopping lists. They need to include details like the name of the ingredient, its nutritional value, and any interesting facts about its origin. In this activity, the students did not only work on their math skills by budgeting but also their literacy skills are enhanced by researching and describing various food items. According to experts, we can utilize the following strategies in enhancing the literacy and numeracy skills of our learners. So we have 
differentiated instruction in which we use various resources and methods to tailor the diverse interests, abilities, and learning styles of our learners. We may also make use of collaborative learning wherein the learners work together in groups in order for them to complete tasks and solve problems. Through this, we can promote peer interaction and cooperative skills among our learners. Another is active learning wherein we engage our students in hands-on activities, experiments, and simulations to help them learn new concepts and skills. We can also make use of the technology integration wherein we utilize educational apps and games through technology so that we can enhance engagement and understanding of both literacy and numeracy. We may also use explicit teaching wherein we break down complex concepts into smaller, more manageable parts and we provide clear and structured instruction to our students. Lastly, we can make use of formative assessment in which it involves providing ongoing feedback to students during the learning process. This can include quizzes, peer assessments, and feedback on written work. It is important to note that our integration of literacy and numeracy should not be superficial. We have to make sure that our integration is intentionally and seamlessly carried out in order to develop both the numeracy and literacy skills of our learners. In other words, the integration should be in-depth and also must align with the overall learning objectives of our lesson. Remember that our aim is to provide our learners with a more holistic learning experience that not only improves their math and language art skills, but also helps them make connections to real-world situations. In summary, our integration of numeracy and literacy should be meaningful and purposeful, serving the lesson's objectives and contributing significantly to the achievement of those objectives. Now let's tackle Indicator 3, Applied a range of teaching strategies to develop critical and creative thinking, as well as other higher-order thinking skills. This indicator ensures that the teacher provides a broad range of questions and activities, including those of higher order that challenge learners to analyze their thinking to promote deeper understanding. Let learners compare and contrast ideas. They synthesize or summarize information within or across disciplines. Let's have the key concepts under this indicator. The key concepts are teaching strategies, critical thinking skills, creative thinking skills, and higher order thinking skills. So let's have teaching strategies. These are methods, approaches, or techniques that teachers use to facilitate the learning process. Teaching strategies can vary widely and are employed to help students grasp and apply new concepts effectively. Teaching strategies are the ways that we use to make our lesson easier to understand for the learners by providing them with clear explanations and relatable examples, thus increasing their engagement and accommodating their different learning styles and needs. Critical thinking skills Critical thinking is the ability to analyze, evaluate, and synthesize information or ideas in a logical and rational manner. It involves examining information objectively, questioning assumptions, and making informed decisions or judgments. By designing lessons that enhance the critical thinking skills of our learners, we are actually helping them to think beyond just memorization. They are encouraged to look something carefully and think about it in a smart and logical way. The role of the teacher is to ask questions, provide meaningful activities where they will analyze information, and make thoughtful decisions about something. Through this, we help them solve problems and make sense of the world around them. For example, to develop the learner's critical thinking skills, the teacher can provide a scenario like this. You are lost in a forest and you have limited supplies. What are the things you would do to survive? This surely enhances the critical thinking skills of our learners. By asking them how to survive in a forest when they're lost with limited supplies enhances critical thinking skills because it challenges them to analyze their situation, problem solve, 
make informed decisions, and consider consequences, all of which are essential aspects of critical thinking. Creative thinking skills. Creative thinking involves generating innovative ideas, solutions, or approaches to problems. It often entails thinking outside the box, embracing originality, and combining existing ideas in novel ways. It means that we encourage our learners to come up with new and clever ideas or ways to solve problems presented to them. It's about thinking in unique and imaginative ways, like finding new uses for things or mixing different ideas together to create something new. For example, this prompt will be given by the teacher to the learners. Imagine a magical tree suddenly appears in your backyard. What extraordinary powers or abilities does it have and how would you use them to make the world a better place? This is an example of an activity that develops the creative thinking skills of the learners because it asks them to use their imagination to invent special powers for a magical tree in their backyard and think about how these powers could be used to make the world a better place. It encourages them to come up with creative and original ideas. Maybe the learners may say, it can grant wishes, so I'd use it to fulfill the dreams of underprivileged children and bring them joy. Next, we have higher order thinking skills. They encompass critical thinking, creative thinking, problem solving, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. Higher order thinking skills are considered more complex mental processes that lead to deeper understanding and application of knowledge. Higher order thinking skills involve thinking more deeply and creatively. It means that students show they can do more than just remember and understand basic facts. They can think in more advanced ways like figuring things out, solving problems, and making connections. Then we have what is called metacognition. Metacognition is one example of higher order thinking. It involves thinking about one's own thinking processes, which is a more advanced cognitive skill. It means thinking about how we think. As teachers who aim to develop the higher order thinking skills of our learners, we tend to help them check how well they understand something, ask them to plan how to learn, and evaluate if their learning strategies are working. It's more advanced than just remembering facts because it helps them become a better learner by managing their thinking. For example, in science class, at the beginning of the lesson, we can ask our students to think about what they already know about the solar system and what they want to learn. This encourages metacognition by prompting our students to reflect on their existing knowledge and set learning goals of the lesson. During the lesson, you can periodically pause and ask our students to check their understanding. For example, you might say, pause for a moment and think about what we've discussed so far. Are there any parts you find confusing or need more clarification? This encourages metacognition by prompting our students to monitor their comprehension and identify areas where they may need help. Then, you can also Ask metacognitive questions such as, what strategies are you using to remember the order of the planets? These questions prompt students to think about their thinking processes and the strategies they use to learn and remember information. It is crucial. Now let's proceed to indicator 4, displayed proficient use of the mother tongue, Filipino, and English to facilitate teaching and learning. It is crucial to ensure that all students can participate in discussions, especially when English is the medium of instruction. We should not assume that silence implies a lack of understanding or unwillingness to answer. Stephen Krashen's research highlights the existence of a silent period for new English learners, during which they may be hesitant to communicate orally. Therefore, it is essential to provide a wait time to allow learners to comprehend questions in English and formulate responses in the same language before resorting to other languages, promoting inclusive communication. 
The key concept that we need to take into consideration in this indicator is proficient use. How are we going to manifest this in our lesson? First, proficient use of mother tongue, Filipino, and English is the ability of the teacher to use the medium of instruction clearly, accurately, and fluently to facilitate the teaching and learning process. In order to achieve this, teachers can make use of the following communication strategies, which was taken from the PPST resource package, module 14, page 9. First is context clues. These are hints or information that can help the learner understand the meaning of a difficult word or phrase. These hints or information can be a synonym, antonym, example, or definition. Now, context clues are hints or information within a text that will help readers or our learners understand the meaning of difficult words or phrases. So, for example, uh, in Filipino class, a teacher might encounter the word malamlam in a text and then use the surrounding sentences to explain its meaning. Then we have paraphrasing, a restatement or a recasting of original statement in another form or other words, usually to simplify the meaning of the text. So paraphrasing involves rephrasing an original statement in simpler words or a different form to clarify its meaning. In an English class, for example, a teacher might paraphrase the sentence, the cat chased the mouse into, the mouse was pursued by the cat. Then we have verbal cue. Prompts in the form of concise phrases that are used to indicate a need for a response or reaction from the listeners. Verbal cues are concise prompts used to elicit responses or reactions from the learners. For example, during a discussion in a history class, a teacher might use a verbal cue like, What do you think happened next? This is to encourage them to participate and share their thoughts. Then we have funneling. It involves starting with a general question and then going down to more specific point in each question in order to gather more and more details. So finally involves starting with a broad or general question and then we progressively narrow it down to gather more specific details from our learners. For example, in a science class, a teacher could begin with a general question, what is photosynthesis? And then funnel down to more specific questions like, what are the key components involved in photosynthesis? Then we have structural analysis. This is dividing a word into parts to understand or get the meaning of the difficult word. Structural analysis involves breaking down a word into parts to understand the meaning of a complex or unfamiliar word. Say for example, in an English class, if a student encounters the word unbelievable, the teacher might explain that it's composed of un, which is the prefix meaning not, and believable meaning able to be believed. So, unbelievable means not able to be believed. Then we have visual imagery. The forming of images are objects in the mind of the learners as they read or listen. The teacher can use rich and stimulating words and expressions to help learners activate their prior knowledge in order to help them form visual images in their minds. This process helps the learners better understand their reading and listening texts. For example, in a literature class, a teacher might describe a scene from a novel vividly using descriptive language to help students visualize the setting and characters. Then we have a sentence frame. Sentence frame is a method of scaffolding that teachers can use to help learners formulate a comment or a response in sentence form. The teacher states an incomplete sentence and the learners will provide the missing words. Sentence frames are incomplete sentences provided by the teacher to assist students in formulating their responses or comments. For example, in a language class, the teacher might provide the sentence frame, I enjoyed blank because blank. 
This is to help students express their opinions about a particular book that they have read. Then we have last is translation. It is the use of language to understand or interpret the meaning of a word from another language. This involves using one language to interpret or understand the meaning of words or phrases in another language. For example, in English class, a teacher might use translation to help students understand a complex English word by providing its equivalent in their mother tongue. Now let's proceed with Indicator 5. Establish safe and secure learning environments to enhance learning through the consistent implementation of policies, guidelines, and procedures. Let's talk about the four key concepts that we need to pay attention here. We have learning environment, secure learning environment, safe learning environment, and consistent implementation. Now, learning environment, according to Glossary of Educational Reform, it is referring to the diverse physical locations, context, and cultures in which students learn. Obviously, this is referring to our classrooms and the kind of culture that we have within it. This concept encompasses the physical locations, context, and cultures in which our students learn. It refers to the overall atmosphere, resources, and conditions that influence a student's learning experience. For example, a positive learning environment might include well-equipped classrooms, access to educational materials, and a culturally inclusive curriculum. A secure learning environment refers to school spaces and activities that free learners from physical harm or risks to promote their well-being and support their learning. A safe learning environment means making sure that students are protected and feel secure. This includes our way of taking steps to prevent things like bullying, violence, accidents, and other dangers to happen. For example, in our schools, we might have security guards, cameras, and plans for what to do in emergencies to keep the environment for our learners safe. Then we have safe learning environment. This involves every aspect of creating a positive experience for students. The physical space is one important element, but equally important are the relationships between students, teachers, and the learning community as a whole. Safety in a learning place is, isn't just about physical security, it's also about making a happy and supportive atmosphere where our learners feel emotionally and mentally secure. This means that it's important to build strong connections between students, teachers, and everyone involved in learning. For example, when we encourage our learners to talk openly and respect each other will help make the learning environment safe. Next is consistent implementation. This refers to the accurate and logically ordered execution of policies, guidelines, and procedures to keep and maintain a safe and secure learning environment in deaf ed schools. This idea emphasizes the need to always follow the rules and procedures in schools to keep our learners safe and secure. It means making sure that the guidelines set by deaf ed are consistently and logically followed. For instance, our regular attendance to trainings on what to do in emergencies is an example of how these rules are consistently applied to ensure a quick and organized response in case of a crisis. As teachers, we can create a safe and secure learning environment by following the school safety rules and making sure these rules are always followed in our classroom. We may talk to our students and let them know they can come to us if they feel unsafe or have worries. It is always a good idea to make our classroom a friendly and welcoming place where everyone feels respected. Let us be ready for emergencies by learning what to do and teaching our students too. Also, we can work together with our fellow teachers and other school staff to ensure safety and security rules are the same for everyone in our school. 
This way, we can help make learning a safe and positive experience for our students. Then let's proceed with Indicator 6. Maintain learning environments that promote fairness, respect, and care to encourage learning. Let's tackle the four key concepts namely fairness, respect, care, and encourage learning. Let's start with fairness. Fairness is ensuring that all students are treated equitably and have equal opportunities to learn. Fairness in our teaching learning situation means making sure all our learners have a fair chance to learn. It's like making a game fair so nobody is at a disadvantage because of things like where they come from, how good they are, or what's happening in their life. For example, it includes helping our learners with disabilities during tests to make sure they can show what they know, just like everyone else. Next is respect. Fostering an environment where students and educators show consideration and regard for each other's opinions, backgrounds, and ideas. Respect in the context of the classroom means making a place where learners and teachers care about each other's thoughts, backgrounds, and ideas. It's like making everyone feel included and open to different points of view. For instance, it means telling our learners that it's okay to share their different ideas in class and making sure we listen to them and think their ideas are important. Then we have care. It is creating an atmosphere of care, which means showing concern, support, and empathy for students' emotional and academic needs. For example, in our classroom, when one of our learners says his tummy hurts, we may show care by quickly helping them. We might ask if he needs to use the bathroom or rest in the nurse's room. We show kindness and doesn't make a big deal in front of everyone. Another example, if our learners do not understand our lesson, we can show our care by being patient, explaining things in different ways, giving them extra help if needed, and making the classroom a place where it's okay to ask questions. This way, it's clear that our students' learning is important and we care about their understanding. We have encouraged learning. Ultimately, the goal of an educational environment is to motivate and inspire students to actively engage in the learning process and achieve their educational goals. Encouragement can take various forms such as positive reinforcement and creating an atmosphere where curiosity is nurtured. For instance, in our classroom, we can motivate and encourage our learners by celebrating their achievements, whether big or small. When our learner does well or makes progress, we give them praises. This boosts their confidence and makes them more excited about learning. This positive support nurtures their curiosity and helps them succeed in their education. Now let's proceed to Indicator 7. Establish a learner-centered culture by using teaching strategies that respond to their linguistic, cultural, socio-economic, and religious backgrounds. Let's study the key concepts for this indicator. We have learner-centered culture, teaching strategies, linguistic background, cultural background, socioeconomic background, and religious background. Let's have a learner-centered culture. This refers to a set of attitudes, conventions, and practices that place the learners at the center of the learning process by using varied teaching modalities, responsive to learners' diverse background, and relevant to meaningful learning experience. A learner-centered culture in the classroom means making our learners the most important part of the learning process. It involves using different teaching methods that consider each learner's background and make learning meaningful for them. For example, we could let our students choose topics they're interested in for a project so they feel more engaged and motivated to learn. This way, it's all about what works best for the learners to help them learn and succeed. Then we have teaching strategies. This refers to pedagogical methods carried out 
through learning activities and materials that are designed based on learners' needs and learning goals. These are the methods and techniques educators use to facilitate learning. In this context, teaching strategies should be adopted to meet the unique requirements of each student based on their background. Differentiated instruction is a teaching strategy that tailors the content, process, and product of learning to accommodate the diverse learning styles and abilities of students. It can be adjusted to consider linguistic, cultural, socioeconomic, and religious backgrounds. For example, in an English 9 class on the topic about communicative styles, I can make use of differentiated instruction in several ways. I can provide a variety of reading materials to accommodate different reading levels and preferences of my learners. I can allow flexible group work where my learners can choose their roles based on their interests, whether it's researching, performing, or writing. For individual assignments, I can let my learners pick specific topics within communicative styles that intrigue them, fostering personal engagement, and then by tailoring the instruction to students' unique needs and learning styles, the class becomes more inclusive and supportive, ensuring that each student can participate effectively and comfortably. Then we have linguistic background. This refers to the language and communication system understood, used, and valued by the learners at home prior to and while in their formal schooling. Acknowledging our students' linguistic backgrounds means understanding the languages they speak well and using that language in our teaching. For example, if we know that our learners are fluent in Tagalog, we might use both English and Tagalog to explain things in the classroom. This helps those students understand better because they can relate to what's being taught in the language that they know well. And then we have cultural background. This refers to the learner's existing values and prior experiences influenced by the traditions, customs, and beliefs of the society where they belong. Understanding our learners' cultural backgrounds means knowing their values and experiences shaped by the customs and beliefs of their society. For instance, if we are aware that some of our learners celebrate different cultural holidays, they might incorporate those celebrations into classroom activities. This can help students feel connected and respected, making the learning experience more inclusive and meaningful for everyone. We have socioeconomic background. This concerns the learner's combined social and economic status characterized by parental education, occupation, income and expenditures, family structure, size, wealth, history and expectations, and home educational resources and access to community resources. Understanding our students' socioeconomic background means considering their family's financial and social situation. For example, if we know that some of our learners may not have access to the internet at home due to financial constraints, we can provide printed materials for homework or offer extra help during school hours. This ensures that all students, regardless of their economic circumstances, have an equal opportunity to succeed in their studies. Lastly, religious background. This refers to the learner's orientation, beliefs, feelings, and practices that defines his or her religion. Recognizing the student's religious background means understanding their faith, beliefs, and religious practices. For instance, if we know that some of our students celebrate certain religious holidays, we can be considerate of this in the classroom schedule, assignments, and discussions. This respect for students' religious beliefs creates a more inclusive and comfortable learning environment, ensuring that their faith is honored while they learn. Also, during prayer before the start of the class, we can start with a moment of quiet reflection where everyone can pray in their own way. We must make sure that the prayer time doesn't favor one religion over another. The learners should know that they can choose to join or not. In doing so, 
we are respecting their beliefs. This makes the classroom inclusive and respectful of everyone's faith. Let's now proceed with Indicator 8. Indicator 8 refers to the practice of adopting and using culturally appropriate teaching strategies to meet the needs of learners from indigenous groups. This indicator highlights the importance of recognizing and respecting the cultural backgrounds, values, and traditions of indigenous students in the classroom to create an inclusive and effective learning environment. This indicator is about making sure that in the classroom, the teacher uses teaching methods that honor the traditions and culture of indigenous students. For example, the teacher might include stories or lessons that come from the history and values of indigenous communities. This helps indigenous students feel like their culture is important and respected in the classroom. It also teaches all students about the beauty of indigenous heritage. This way, the classroom becomes a place where everyone's culture is valued, making the learning environment more welcoming and positive. In the classroom, we can use this indicator by including stories and views from indigenous people in our lessons. For instance, in a history class, talking about early settlers, we can bring in indigenous guest speakers or stories from local indigenous communities. This helps all students learn about indigenous culture and why it's important. It makes the classroom more welcoming and helps everyone understand and respect the indigenous students' culture and history. Let's proceed with Indicator 9, Used Strategies for Providing Timely, Accurate, and Constructive Feedback to Improve Learner Performance. And let's study these key concepts. First, we have Timely Feedback, Accurate Feedback, Constructive Feedback, and Learner Performance. Let's tackle each one of these. Timely feedback is given within a time frame where the results of assessment can still enable learners to take specific steps towards the achievement of the learning goals. Timely feedback means telling our learners how they're doing on their work while there's still time for them to make improvements. For example, if the learners take a test, we can quickly grade it and discuss the results with the class. This way, our learners can see where they need to improve and take steps to do better in their learning. It helps them reach their goals. Then we have accurate feedback. This refers to the level and extent of attainment of learners of a given competency, skill, or standard. This concept is about providing our learners with a clear assessment of their performance and understanding of the subject matter. For example, an elementary school English teacher is assessing students' writing skills. Instead of just marking spelling and grammar errors, the teacher provides detailed feedback on the organization of the learner's essays, the coherence of arguments, and the use of evidence to support their points. This comprehensive feedback helps learners understand not only their errors but also the overall quality of their writing. Then we have constructive feedback. This form of feedback is motivating and sensitive to the feelings of the learner. It gives the learner the direction to improve better in class. Constructive feedback is about helping students get better without making them feel bad about their work. For instance, if a student did a science project and made a big mistake, we do not just say they're wrong. Instead, we can first give praises to the learner for doing his best, then we kindly suggest better ways to do it, and give extra help. This way, the student feels encouraged to learn from their mistakes and do better next time. We have learner performance. This describes how the learner demonstrates the knowledge, skills, and attitudes they have learned. To give helpful feedback, it's important to know how students show what they know and can do. For example, if a kindergarten teacher is looking at how well students use their small hand muscles and creativity in an art project, the teacher knows that not all kids are the same. 
So some like to draw and some like to make things with clay. The teacher looks at each student's work based on what they're good at and what they like. Then the teacher gives feedback that makes the students want to keep getting better at art in their own way. In summary, a teacher who effectively applies Indicator 9 recognizes the importance of timely, accurate, and constructive feedback tailored to individual learner performance. By doing so, they create a supportive and motivating learning environment that helps students achieve their learning objectives and improve their overall performance. That's the end of our discussion of the 9 Indicators of the Classroom Observation Tool or COT for Teachers 1-3 to for School Year 2023-2024. to Thank you so much for watching. Please support me by hitting that like button, click subscribe, leave a comment, and share it to your friends. Till my next videos, bye!